going then. So we're going to cover, we're going to finish up from last week and then um, start into chapter four with the, the, uh, the case study. Sure. So, uh, so let me um, share my screen. Uh, I think we got about three minutes left, so we could probably do a quick icebreaker like we've done in the past. Um, so everybody can see my desktop, right? Mm -hmm. See my slides? Okay, cool. Uh, so we're week five. Um, tonight we'll talk mainly about chapter four, case study, ER injuries. Um, so, but before we get started, we got a couple minutes. Um, we've all been kind of practicing this shiny and using R recently. Um, has anybody come across or heard of any good tips? Anything that you've learned that you'd like to share with the group? Any, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be shiny related. It can just be anything. Any tips that you've come across lately? So every once in a while on Twitter, I see people that say um, that you can use the, the, uh, the keyboard shortcut control shift M, I think to insert the pipe, but I would suggest for me anyway, what I, what I did was I changed that keyboard shortcut to alt greater than so that now I use alt dash for the assignment arrow and alt greater than for the pipe. And it just goes back and forth. It's it, and they both start with alt. One of them is towards the top and one of them is towards the bottom. And I use the same finger for both of them. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's my tip that I, that I use. That's a good one. Who else? I don't know if anybody's messed with uh, uh, our tweet before. So on one of our assignments for the R for book club, uh, John had asked us to uh, go to a, to a, uh, I think it's, it's not our tips. It's uh, our something. It's it's something on Twitter. Anyway, um, our stats. is it our hashtag our stats? Well, it's our stats, but this is like a like the same question that that Colin is asking us, like a like a quick tip kind of thing. And I I I've always wanted to try and get into to our Twitter as a whole just to download uh, directly. This uh, I figured out that it worked yes or last night. Um, I'm sending a link uh, in our team or our uh, uh, Zoom communication uh, for anybody that wants to check it out. I'm gonna, I haven't actually ran the entire script yet, but it's uh, building a shiny app to uh, control your Twitter API. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was really cool to, to tie in multiple cohort book clubs together. Um, one of the funniest parts that I want to share with the team, though, is I've got an RStudio uh, server that I'm running. So when you are asking for your, your authentication, uh, it just opens up a local machine browser and then you authenticate this R2 tweet uh, 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 package. Unfortunately, it doesn't pass it to the server. So I'm still trying to figure out how I can get my uh, uh, OAuth uh, authentication to go through on the server site. It's a headless box. I, I connect to it through a browser. So I thought that was kind of a funny twist to the uh, uh, entire conversation as a whole. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Kevin. I was going to piggyback on my <laughs> my woes for the weekend. Is uh, my project should have been in a where you can lock your project down to the environment. Um, you can do that with Docker, or you can do it with our. I'm trying to think our environment where you lock down your packages and versions. <laughs> so lesson learned. That's what I'll be doing with the next one. <laughs> that was my that was my tip too is i i started using our environment too and it is just awesome like it, it's just great i think a person that we used to have in this in our cohort sandra used to talk about our environment and i started playing around with it and yeah it's great so if you're looking at worrying about managing dependencies in your projects our environment is just great Okay, uh, I, I will also share one, one tip. So recently I've been uh, learning the R, uh, learning the R Shiny um, from one of the tutorials in R Studio, you know, the ones that they post on the online. And uh, one of the function I learned is called observe event. Observe event that, I, I don't know we learned this before or not. Did we learn this already? No, we'll come up, we'll come up to it tonight, but yeah. Oh, uh, we'll okay. Come. That's great. 
Okay, observe the event. I, uh, I just learned it actually yesterday because I, I was thinking that I will, I will not review some, something or practice something before I come. And uh, I found out that observe event is a very good if you want to prevent the prevent your app from automatically update the data. So if you use if you for example if you have a action bottoms called update, it will uh, it will only update once you uh, once you hit the update bottom. So it, it gives you a control of the app. Okay, this is one of the tips I want to share. Thanks, Guy. Appreciate that. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight too. So excellent. Uh, anybody else? I appreciate everybody sharing. Um, I do like the five minute icebreakers. It's good to kind of get to know everybody, but it's also a good opportunity for us to share some of the things that we're learning. And so I come across things every day that I wish I could share with somebody else because I only work with a few people that use R. So it's great to kind of share those tips. Um, so like Ryan said tonight, uh, oh, well, here's some reminders. Most of us have been in the session. I'm not going to, I'm not going to belabor us by going over these, but the biggest one again is discussions, the big thing. So, um, we would rather treat these sessions, you know, not as a lecture, but more as a discussion. So if you have a question or you have a comment or you want to add to it, please do. You're not going to hurt our feelings. You're not going to hurt my feelings. And it's just the best way that we all learn. And so, um, please jump in whenever you, whenever you, whenever you want to. Uh, so, like Ryan said tonight, we'll finish chapter three talking about basic reactivity. That includes uh, digging a little bit deeper into reactive expressions. We'll wrap up with observers. It'll probably take us about 10, 15 minutes to get through that material, and then Ryan's going to start talking about chapter four case studies, ER injuries, and then we can have a little discussion about week number number five coming up next. What we want to do. So let's kind of dive right into where we were at last time. Uh, we were talking about reactive expressions and we were really discussing that reactive expressions are great as a tool to reduce duplication. And so we use this not only to reduce duplication, but we also do this to um, simplify our reactive graph as well as reduce the amount of redundant code and recomputation that we have to do. And so, how we do that is we use this function called reactive. And so anytime that you're gonna create a reactive expression, you have to use reactive so that you're uh, creating a reactive context to take in those inputs. Now the book, I, I reread the chapter earlier this week and I, I remember reading about looking at it and seeing that two of the common ways to kind of meet these goals of reducing duplication and reducing uh, uh, being more efficient at removing redundant code in an R script would be trying to write a function or to assign a variable. However, that's not going to work in a shiny context because it requires a reactive context to actually work. And so the only way that we can, I shouldn't say the only way, because you can use a function, but it doesn't work as well as the reactive function itself to create that reactive context. So uh, go ahead. Somebody have a question? I thought somebody was jumping in. Oh, sorry. So reactive expressions uh, have a flavor of both inputs and outputs. So like inputs, you can use the results of a reactive expression in an output. And like outputs, reactive expressions depend on inputs and automatically know when they need updating. And so um, with reactive expressions, they're robust enough to know when things are changing within the app. And so when the user changes some type of input, it's going to change. Uh, it's going to either change our output that we're going to have pushed to the actual UI. So the book kind of discusses this difference between producers and consumers, because now we've added a new element to our reactive graph, which is the reactive expressions. And so before we were just talking about inputs and outputs, but now because we've added this element of expression, we have to add a little bit more. Um, we have to add some more vocab to our toolbox here. So the first one is being producers. Producers refer to reactive inputs and expressions. And then we have the other element, which is consumers. And consumers refer to reactive expressions and outputs. Now, the reason why we use this as producers is because they send information out. And then we use consumers because they take information in. And you can see reactive expressions 
is both a consumer and a producer. Out inputs are producers because they send information, only send information out. Outputs are consumers because they only take information in. Now, what I really highly suggest, like looking over the app example that the book has in chapter three, because I think it really does a good job of expressing, you know, this difference between producers and consumers and um, producers and consumers, and also understanding how reactive gra or how reactive expressions fit within that. So the book also talks about execution order as well. And I think this is an important distinction between our perception of just scripting language versus writing code for a Shiny app. Because when we write a scripting language, we talked about this last time, is that our script runs left to right, top to bottom, and order matters. However, in Shiny, because on the back end it's using a reactive graph, the order doesn't necessarily matter. So if you look at this, if you look at this example here, I've taken out the UI code to simplify this, but this is just our greeting app that we've been using in the past. Here's the example of the greeting app that we've been using. We have one input by the user, which is the user telling us their name. And then we have two text outputs, you know, one saying, hello, Colin, and the other one have a nice day. And so now with this execution order, what matters, what, what it doesn't matter uh, how the reactive expression is put within the server function. So when we look at this, we would think that because render text comes before the reactive expression, that this wouldn't work. However, this does work in, um, in Shiny because it's using on the back end that reactive graph to tell us how do things actually work. And so going back, when you think about, when you think about putting your apps together, is really think about what does your code or how does your code create that reactive graph? Or let me put it another way to be more clear is think about how your code gets visualized in the reactive graph. So if we take this code here and we actually visualize it within this reactive graph, here again, our input, our reactive expression and our output, we could see that this is the execution order for that. And again, just because it's out of order in our code doesn't necessarily mean it's going to affect that reactive graph on the back end of it. Uh, can anybody tell me, the book does discuss an issue with this, though. Well, and I kind of gave you the answer here, but what's the issue with this, though? Yes, it does work, but what's the issue if you write your code like this? You'll go crazy debugging it. It's the first thing. <laughs> Yeah, they're hard to read, right? They're hard to read because naturally, you know, if you think about people who just normally use just R coding for a scripting language rather than thinking about the actual Shiny, how Shiny actually works on the back end, people would expect that your reactive expression comes before your actual output comes first. And so it's not as human readable. And so just like Kevin said, it's just hard to, it's hard to debug this. It's hard to read it. It's hard to understand it. And again, just because we're creating an application that, just because we're creating an application doesn't mean, doesn't mean that we should not write our code to be not human readable. So make sure that you're kind of thinking about, okay, somebody's going to be looking at this. So take that into consideration when you're putting this together. So the book also talks about different ways to kind of control the timing of, of evaluation. And the book kind of talks about two different ways to control how things are evaluated within a Shiny app. The first one was talking about timed invalidation, and then the second one was on click. Now, the time, the time invalidation is going to use this new thing called reactive timer. Now, with reactive timer, and here's just, the, here's just the example of the server code using reactive timer, but what it does is it's having, it's creating a reactive expression using, or it's going to create a reactive expression that is dependent on the system time of the computer or the server to which your application is running. And what's nice about this, and the book talks about this in regards to um, the application that both visualizes two distributions and tests the difference between those two distributions using a t-test. What's nice about this is, is that it takes that reactive timer here, and then it applies it within our reactives here and as a reactive expression. And so every half second, what happens is, is that it, re, it creates a new sample. 
And so when you're watching the application run, it just changes the sample and the visualization over and over again. Now I was trying to, I was kind of running out of time before the session, but what I did was as I actually ran this on locally on my computer and I was watching it, it was kind of neat to see how it actually changed using this reactive timer element. So again, what's really nice about this is you can see that this has the reactive expression timer, which is dependent on the actual input of the system time. Now, this isn't necessarily provided by the user. It's not explicitly provided, but their system provides the actual value within timer. Um, I was trying to play around with this earlier with an application that I've been kind of playing around with. I couldn't get it to work, but um, it's kind of an interesting way to think about how to kind of add some animation to your application. Now, the one that you will probably use, um, probably use more than you will the actual time invalidation is on click using an input like an action button. So something that you want to do is you want to submit or you want to you want to submit something. You want your uh, you want your application to uh, perform some action, but you also want to control that performance or give your user the ability to control when that computation is going to occur rather than just having your application automatically do it you could have an action button to um, have your user select when that computation is going to happen. Now, when you do this, you're gonna to have to use two different, you're gonna to have to use the input action button, which I was talking about. And then you're gonna to have to use this new event reactive function to create the reactive expression. And what's nice, and the thing about event reactives is it takes two different, it takes two different, I'm gonna call them arguments, it's going to take your input action, so your input simulate, and then it's going to take your function that you want to run as a result of that event. So this action will not occur until you actually have that input take place. And so in our case with that application that um, was shared within the book, the user actually has to hit the, um, I think it's called simulate, the simulate button to actually occur within it. Okay. Now, what's nice about this is what the diagram is, is that now X1 and X2, which were the actual, um, which were the sample creation that the book was talking about, it's dependent on simulate rather than the Lambda 1 and in Lambda 2. So before any of this computation takes place, the user needs to hit simulate. Once it hits simulate, then X1 and X2 um, computes, computes the uh, distribution using Lambda 1 and in Lambda 2. Now, I know I'm kind of going over this quickly. I wanted to share the example with you, but I do want to give Ryan some time to look at it. But I do highly, highly, highly suggest look at that application in the book, that example, because it really does do a good job of describing, okay, how do you use time invalidation and how do you use on click to actually um, give your user the control to control computation? So what questions do you have so far about um, time to validation or on click? You mentioned that the, the click button has two, two arguments. One is input and then the name of the item. And then the second argument is just the action to, to take the function to execute when the button's clicked. That's the way I read it, is it's gonna take the expression that you want to perform. So you obviously have the input, right? So event reactive is, is waiting for you to actually click the action button. And then the second part, and I'm gonna call this the second argument, I'm using this terminology kind of loosely here, is the action or the function that's gonna be performed as a result of this action. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Again, I'm using I'm using terminology kind of loosely here because I'm still kind of learning this and wrapping my mind around it. So if I am saying something incorrectly, somebody please correct me. Um, what other questions can I answer for you? I, I think I think really event reactives. When I was looking at this, I think event reactives are going to be really important because again, it gives you more control or it gives your user more control on the type of computation they want to perform. And so I have a feeling that pretty much, I have a feeling that I shouldn't say any application, but 
more likely than not, some of your applications are probably going to use an event reactive if you're going to give your user the ability to control when things are actually going to happen. Um, the book also talks about, and I'm not going to spend too much time because it's going to talk about it later, I think in chapter 15, but it was really kind of cool in the example to see how the computation of these two distributions was taken out of the server function and was created into its own separate function. And so the book kind of really talks about that when you're writing a good, when you're writing good shiny application code, you really want to take that computation out of it. You don't want your server function bogged down running a lot of computation. Because if you do that, it's going to be a very slow experience for your users. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it tonight because we're going to talk about it later in chapter 15. But I thought that was kind of a very, very like powerful concept that I never really thought about. And so it's something that we'll come back to. So the last thing that we'll discuss is observers. And so we talked a little bit about this last time was observers are um, is a function that we can use anytime we wanna make a call or we wanna do something outside of the application. So the book talks about things like saving a file to a shared drive, sending data to an API, updating a database, printing debugging messages. This is where we're gonna use those observer, observer, observe events. And so, these observers, we use observe event to actually do this. And so I kind of put this little diagram together to think about potentially ways to kind of think about this because the book still uses this diet, it still uses these symbols for observers and it considers them to be outputs, which they are, they're outputs outside of our application. But what's important to know about observers is that they're not intended to make any changes to the UI. And so, and I say that kind of loosely because I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I, I was kind of thinking of ways that you might, where observers might influence the UI, but that might be like an edge case that I really don't know or can necessarily explain. But really high level, what the book was talking about is that these observer functions, they're intended to do things outside of the application. So say you wanted to write in our application, you wanted to write my name that I entered into it you would use an observe event to potentially write a SQL query to insert it into, a, into some type of table. So there are two important differences between observe event and event reactive. You don't call or assign the result of observe event to a variable. So you can't refer to it in, in, in any other reactive consumers. So it's not like our reactive expressions that we're using where we actually um, apply those we, we apply those to a variable to which then we could call in our UI section of it. So um, that's kind of a big difference there. Big picture of observers within this chapter. We didn't necessarily talk about any of these external things that we want to do. The big one was printing debugging messages. And so if you're having issues debugging, the book really talks about in this chapter using this observe event to log those different outputs to the console so you can kind of do better debugging. So, and that's chapter three, right at about 15 minutes. What questions do you have? There's no way I, I explain this as clearly as I could. So there's gotta be questions because <laughs> I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So it's like, um, does anybody, with uh, experience, um, what, what's your experience with these observers? I can add to the to the one comment about debugging. So I made a statement a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were talking about error handling, and a lot of the times when you're just reliant on the uh, base operating system or the or the service that you're running, sometimes the 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 output of a of an error is very not very helpful. Uh, by managing those errors and, and, and writing, uh, I don't know, breadcrumbs for yourself or as a debugging service, you can go in and, and start catching when uh, error occurs because it may be outside of, of what you would normally be in control of. Um, earlier when we were talking about the, the uh, R environment and your different package management or, or making sure that everything's aligned properly, that would be a great use case example of using debug messages to realize crap, I got the wrong package. That's why I continually get this error. You can go in and, and, and add that to some kind of a, a log file. 
Um, uh, if you've ever used Stack Overflow or any other sort of forum, one of the first things that a developer is going to ask you for is, hey, what was the error message you have? Well, they want to know what version that you're using of a package. They want to know what the error message is so they can help you uh, debug or, 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 I don't know, correct whatever error is happening. Does that help? Uh, well, I think that's, I mean, I think that's an interesting point with these observers was like, I think the biggest pain point of learning Shiny for me was it's hard to see like what's getting created because I go back to that, like I'm used to that scripting part, you know, yes. I can see what a variable looks like. It's hard for me to see what a reactive or what the, what the output of a reactive expression is. Right. And so that's always been the hardest thing for me. And now on top of it, you have to add this and this is going beyond this chapter, but like if you're doing like computation of like filtering or aggregating certain numbers together, it's hard to see that object that you're creating like in between in that reactive expression, even though you're supposed to, according to the book, take that computation outside of the server. And so that's just always been the biggest pain point for me. And, and I was messing around with an app and that's where these observer uh, observe event came in is because I was able to print, okay, here's what the tibble looks like from your reactive expression. Well, and I wanted to add one more comment and it goes back to a, a, com a statement you made a moment ago. Um, everything in a web development framework is always optimizing time. And when we, when we, when we use the word time, I'm talking in microseconds. So the amount of efficiency that you can build into a service in a web framework is going to uh, uh, benefit you in the long run or your user experience in the long run. Uh, there's a school of thought that says if the web page takes more than a second or two seconds to load, you've already lost the attention of your, of your user. Um, if we look at Amazon Web Services and a lot of the, the future of serverless computers or, or just stack management in general, optimizing code to be extremely efficient will benefit you not from a time frame cost, but also a monetary cost, the amount of flops that that, that service has to render, um, you're going to actually save yourself in the long run. So optimizing code is also a, a big deal as well. Observers can be, I was going to say observers can be a little really tricky. I had the worst time with it and I realized that um, I was trying to do an update to a list, to a drop down based on an observer. I I wouldn't recommend it in a complex app. I really should have been using a button to have them update rather than an observer. So that was my experience of observers is that they're really tricky to get a handle on if you're trying to do something a little bit too complex. <laughs> I was trying to have it like, if you click on this, observe you click on this drop down, and then based on what you picked, it was supposed to update another input and it didn't work. <laughs> so I really just need to have a button. I was trying to avoid them having to press the button, but that's just gonna, how it's going to have to be. Excellent. Uh, what other questions or comments does anybody have about chapter three? Well, it sounds like um, sounds like we're ready to jump over to chapter four, Ryan. Okay. Sounds good. All right, I'll take over then. So. Um, I don't know how far we'll get on this. We might just end up um, like ending. I'm going to make sure that we stay on time, but we might end up cutting it off just like right in the middle. So um, let me start out. So chapter four is the is the case study. Did anybody get a chance to to work through the, the case study, the code that was there? Um, and I'm asking because it'll help me know how much time to spend as we look at the code itself. So, um, all right, so maybe we'll take it a little bit slower, which will be fine. But let me start out with this quote from the book, which I think is probably the best quote that I've read from Hadley Wickham, which comes from this chapter. Can you guys see it okay? It says, women tend to live longer than men. So at older ages, there are simply more women alive to be injured by toilets. Very, very wise words from, from Hadley. But um, what we're getting at here is the, uh, the data set. He's talking about the data set that we're using, which is for um, basically to cover injuries. So if I look back here at, um, let me go back a couple of slides here. Uh, 
So we're going to be talking about um, ER injuries. And the idea here is to build a more complex shiny app and to use some of the things that we've been studying so far. Um, First of all, the, the, uh, the packages that are used here are Shiny, Vroom, and Tidyverse. And Shiny, we're used to, Tidyverse, we're used to. Vroom, if you're not already used to it, is uh, it's just a way of quickly downloading tab-separated uh, tab separated data. So if you want to follow along, um, go ahead and, and you can load these three packages in there. And then we'll use those to extract the data set. So we'll be looking at, uh, at data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, which covers accidents reported from a sample of hospitals in the US. Right? And so we've got uh, in the data set, there's, there's actually three data sets. There's one called injuries, one called products, and one called, uh, called population. Okay? So the injuries one really just downloads in information, injury information, has a date, age of a patient, sex, race, body part, diagnosis, location, product code, weight, and then there's uh, one more variable called narrative. Okay. So you get the idea here that someone reports to the emergency room and complains of some kind of ailment and they log that information here. Okay. Um, the, second product, the second table here is called products and that's just really a lookup off of this product code. So it tells you what 1807 means, what 676 means, 649 and so on. Um, and then there's population data, which allows you to, uh, they use it to extrapolate the, the incidents that would occur in the general U.S. population based off of a small sample of, of what you get here in the injuries. All right. Everybody good so far? All right. So if you want to follow along, um, I am, I'm just going to load these in. You can watch in the, in the screen here. So we'll load Shiny, load Room. And we'll load Tidyverse, just takes a second. And then there's these commands here to actually download the data. And I don't know them super well, but if we run all of these, we'll get that data downloaded. Just takes a second. Okay. And then we'll actually assign these two objects. So injuries, and we can see the, the injuries data and as we were looking at it before. I'm just in a different format, obviously. And then we didn't get to see a second ago, we didn't get to see the narrative, but you get the idea of what it is. It's, it's a very short description of what actually happened. Um, and uh, these actually, these are kind of fun to read through. Um, now, some of them, um, reflect um say and um, some of them occurred because of uh, like mental illness and the 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 effects of age and there's really nothing to laugh at about those um some of them are they just have a slapstick element in it and for better or for worse that appeals to me so i did find myself laughing at, at a few of these but we'll get into them so all right so that is injuries um we'll also do products and we'll do population all right. Okay, so that covers loading the data in. And now we move on to exploration. Okay. So Hadley decides to start looking, first of all, at accidents related to toilets. Okay, so, um, so he does this where he, he uses the injuries and he selects, uh, selects that product code, which is the one for toilets. Okay. You can see there's a fair amount of, there's some data around there. So then um, he continues to explore using certain variables, like he, to look at this data using location by body part and by diagnosis. So here you can see um, location where these injuries take place. You can see body parts where the injuries take place. And you can see the, the different diagnoses that come as well, okay? And then last of all, the, uh, we create a summary, okay? So we use um, age, sex, and then this weight for the U.S. population, uh, join it onto the population, and then 
come up with a, another rate number here. All right, so we'll do, we'll run that and then we plot it into a line graph and you'll see that show up over here. All right, no problem. Okay. So what we have just done is we created three tables, the one for, uh, for location, the one for body part and the one for diagnosis. But as we saw, they all printed into the console and that's not very helpful for like a fresh shiny app or for users. And we also created this plot, which again, just showed up here into the plots pane, also not super helpful for users. So the idea is now is that we're gonna take these three tables and this plot and create them in a shiny app, okay? All right. So um, the first thing that we need to do is create the values that'll be in, the, in a dropdown for product code. So users can select which product code. Uh, we've talked about toilets already, but if you if they wanted to look at um, whatever the other are, things are the other products um, they'll be able to do that i think there's there's knives there's furniture different kinds of things right so that's what this code does is is creates the the values that you'll see when you drop down for products okay and then we move on into actually creating the ui the ui is going to have three rows one of them is going to be the drop down to pick the product. The next one is going to have the three tables, one for diagnosis, one for body part, and one for location. And then the third row is going to have the, the plot. Okay. Everybody with me so far? So far, so good. So if we just run this UI section, um, those will all load into the UI. Okay. And then on, this, on, the, on the server side, there's going to be a reactive to capture what, what is being input, what's being selected for the product. Okay. And then there's also going to be an output to the diagnosis table, an output to the body part table, and an output to the location table, which correspond to these three locations in the UI. And then last of all, there's going to be, um, there's a, a reactive here as well for the plot uh, to calculate, to update the plot based off of, of what the selection is. And then we're gonna render the plot out to that location um, that was specified here. Okay. So we will, we'll run that right now too. Um, this UI server. There we go. So create the server. All right. Let me just say that while I was going through this and trying to understand how all these different parts went together, I needed to go through it step by step on my own. And I tried to come up with, with a, a graphic that would make it clearer for me. So I'll share this graphic with you right now. Um, and it looks like it might be kind of busy, but um, anyway, let me just talk through it so you can kind of get a glimpse of what's going to be showing up in our ultimate shiny app. Like we talked about, there's going to be the top row that has a product drop down, and then there's going to be a row of plots. In this example, there's only one, uh, not plots, tables. There's going to be a row of tables. In this example, there's only one table, the diagnosis table, and then you can see the plot starting to show up behind. Okay. So what I, what I put here for myself to keep it all straight is that in the UI section of the Shiny app, the actual code, this input element is created with this code. Select input, uh, input ID, product code, label equals product, and choices equals product codes. The element itself is called, called product code, which we see here, which is um, next to the, is the value for the input ID. And the server section of the Shiny app references the value in it as input dollar sign product code. Okay. Since the value will change based on the user input, input product code will likely be included in a reactive expression in the server section and will re represent what the user has currently selected or entered there. That value will likely be used in the logical capacity in the server section, maybe as a filter value if it's a character string or as a multiplier if it's numeric and so on. Okay. So UI drop down 
Then moving on to this table, this element is also created in the UI section, but for output. It is essentially a placeholder for a table that will be generated in the server section. This output table element is called diag and is created with table output, output ID, diag. The server will process data using the UI's inputs, generate a table of results, and place the rendered table here. The server references this element in the UI as output, dollar sign, diag. And then in this example, selected is a reactive created in the server section, which uses the value and in input product code as a filter for a larger data set. Since the data set injuries needs to be filtered by the user selected value in input product code, the reactive selected holds input product codes value and modifies injuries appropriately as the user changes selections. Each time the user modifies the input using input product code, the reactive object selected also updates. And then there's the code for creating that, uh, um, that reactive. And then lastly, once the reactive object selected modifies the injuries database based on user input, separate code renders that modified data set into a table and loads it to the designated placeholder in the UI, namely output diag. And then there's the code for that. So then to summarize it all here, I've got create an input UI element called product code. Its value as determined by the user is referenced that way. Then create an output UI element that will display the results generated by the server. This output placeholder is referenced as output diag. And then number three, create a reactive expression that incorporates input product code into an operation. This reactive expression is called selected and then assign the reactive expression object to an output object in the UI. This reactive expression, the one called selected, is assigned to output diag created in step two. When assigning to an output object, the reactive expression name needs parentheses, selected parentheses. All right. So I think generally everybody on this call has a lot more experience than I do with this, but what, it, what I needed to do was go through and think about how all these different parts fit together. And I think I finally got my mind around it where there, there's, in this case, just one input on part of the UI, but then there's a placeholder for the table. This input, because it's going to be changing and that matters, is going to go into a reactive expression on the server part uh, of the code. And then after the output, after the, after the, the out, after the server processes output using the reactive expression, it goes into this output location that was specified in the UI as well. So anyway, that was it. That was what helped me. Um, it might be a good time to stop and see if anybody has any questions on this. It's good to kind of walk through this. Um, the one thing that helped me kind of go through this was actually going through the code and creating the reactive graph. And I think that um, just kind of doing the reactive graph kind of shows you how things are all connected because it's like everything's, I should say everything, but mostly pretty much all of your outputs are connected to your inputs in some way. And so it's kind of nice to go through and see, like just walking through and saying like, okay, where's all my inputs, label all my inputs. What are my outputs, label the outputs. Are there any reactive expressions? And so um, just kind of how you kind of walk through this, Ryan, is kind of helpful because you kind of helps kind of see how things are connected. And I think that's really kind of important is knowing, okay, how one thing is connected to the other and how that connection based on user input is going to influence the actual output. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was helpful for me to finally make the connection. I, I couldn't quite get my mind around what you create first and what, what all the different things mean and how do you refer to them, but, uh, but it started to settle in for me. So, anybody else? All right. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so then the next uh, part that we go into, we've done the exploration. Now we start to build the prototype of the app. Okay. Um, we actually covered a lot of this too, how the UI is built, these different sections of the UI, the code on the server side as well. And so if we run that, cross our fingers. It'll be popping up. Okay. 
Right. So it allows you then to select different products, tableware, and then everything will update as well because as we mentioned, it goes into the reactive expression, bathtubs or showers, and then the ever famous toilets, right? And the graphs down at the bottom also changed. So, um, <clears throat> so it seems to be working. This is the idea of uh, the basic idea of the prototype anyway, injuries from jewelry also captured. Um, but the next thing that we wanted to do then, um, and stop me if you have any questions on this, but the next thing that, that we wanted to do in the book is to, uh, to polish the tables. Okay. So instead of having those big long tables, um, just to capture the, the top five, to make it a little bit easier to see. So um, let me go to output number five. So if we um, uncomment that, uncomment that. If you guys can hear the background noise, I apologize. Those are happy sounds, even though they sound like they're not. All right, so that makes the changes then. So we, the, well, the change here under 4.5 um, is to, it makes the, the width a little bit wider for the tables. Um, I thought there was a part here that reduced it to just five. I guess we'll see here in a second when we rerun this. Uh, I might need to go back. Good. All right. So this is what ended up being, I thought, pretty interesting here. So uh, you still get to select which product is important, um, but then you get you, you can also make some predictions about where things are going to show up. So this particular plot, it has age from zero to 80 plus years, and then it has the estimated number of injuries. And so I think it's kind of interesting if you take like something like um, let's say basketball, you're not going to see a lot of injuries taking place in the upper parts of the, of the age uh, axis, right? Most of them take place down here under, you know, 20, early 20s, teen, teenage years and so on. Um, you can change that as well. There are probably not a lot of old, older people using trampolines. And so you see a lot of the injuries um, among the younger, younger generations. Um, on the other hand, Let's see what jewelry shows. Injuries from jewelry. Very, very young ages. So maybe toddlers, um, teens and 20s, and then on down. Nothing, nothing in, the, um, in the older ages. Uh, on the other hand, stairs or steps. This you might see, well, what, what would you expect to see here? If you're me, you're probably going to see some of the older ages, and then you're probably going to see quite a few toddlers yeah. as well. And wouldn't you know it? So a lot of toddlers. And then uh, over the ages, I guess it was pretty ended up being pretty consistent. And then naturally, we, we have to look at toilets. Toilets tend to be particularly dangerous, at least in using this data for, for people of advanced age. Um, and you can see also that, that it distinguishes male and female here. And the, the female pop population tends to be higher than the male population at these ages. And it goes back to what Hadley taught us at the beginning of this section that probably the reason is that women live longer and therefore there are just more women alive to be injured by toilets. Are there any other ones that you guys wanted to, to look at real quick? There's anything that sticks out to you? Ladders might be interesting. The very young and the very old do not get uh, injured by ladders. And then beds and bed frames. So that's kind of interesting as well, too. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? All right. 
So then the next part of the um, of the the chapter here was um, it's it's four point six. It's called rate versus count. It was just an update to the plot um, to to change some things about the plot, and I didn't think that it was particularly important, so we'll just skip that one. Um, but then we go into number uh, four point seven where we want to add a button to sample the accident story related to the currently chosen product and display it. So you remember those, those narratives that we looked at. So in here, it adds in um, an event reactive that we were just gotten done talking about. So that when the button is clicked or the selected data changes, then, then it, it, uh, it gives you the narrative. So the way that they did this action button is they put a button there called story and it's labeled tell me a story and then when you click it um, it will randomly select a sample of one narrative matching the um, the, the value that you've selected okay. so let me add that part in as well while that's rendering i did have a question about this one sure um, so there's like a list, it goes like list. So it's in the event reactive. It's like list, uh, it's like list the input comma, then the reactive. Can somebody tell me what that's doing? So yeah. right there on line number, like 203, you have list input, you have the input story, and then you have the reactive expression selected. What does that do? It's because I think the selected is the reactive of the filter, right? Right. Yeah. So, so it's selected. selecting the, 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 so when you select the category of product, so it's matching up the story with the product, right? Right. Yeah, so let me find the reactive. So here's the reactive filter the product based off of what's been selected in the code. Right? Mm -hmm. So I guess what's throwing me off is what's the list function doing in that case? I don't, I don't know. I'll leave it to somebody else to weigh in on that. That's what threw me off because I don't like, I don't know if anybody's okay. attempted to do the, if anybody's attempted to do like the final exercise of this, like I just couldn't figure out what that does. Like well, I just, I'm, kind of almost, I'm almost wondering if it's like some kind of a uh, recursive type function, right? It's like the server feeding itself back into the code that's going to output whatever the server's giving you, right? So it's, it's not sorting the list, but it's, it's saying whatever the user selected select that and also whatever other function or whatever other uh, uh, lookup that it's making within the, the data frame. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. The recursive side of it is when you start to feed code back into itself. Uh, it's, it's nothing that the, the user is going to experience, but the, uh, the object-oriented programming, you start to uh, create additional uh, threads or uh, additional calculations inside the, the, the function call itself. Maybe I'm interpreting it incorrectly too. No, I just, I, I'll be honest. Like when I first looked at this, I was like, I have no idea what this does. So um, I think I kind of understand it. Like I looked up what that list function does and it says it's, it's functions to construct, coerce, and check for both kinds of our lists. So is it like, I'm wondering if it's a, is it like a test to make sure that it is a list? Well, it, wouldn't it be creating a list? Oh, it could be construct. Yeah, because functions yeah. to construct. It's creating a list. It, and I don't know all the arguments for event reactive, but it looks to me like it's passing first. This list is the first argument made up of the value and story and also the reactive. And then the second argument is the the sample. I think you're right. I think I remember what when Kevin was saying is it's creating the list. It's creating the list based off of our reactive, which was the selective, but it's also being controlled by the user input of that action button. And so the action button gets hit, then 
it creates the selected as a list and then it pulls the narrative from that list. That's what I'm guessing. That's the way, that's the middle model that I have right now. Well, it's, it's almost like manipulating it in the data stream then, right? So the, the, the calculations kind of almost like a, I don't know, like a said type action where, you know, you're searching for a term and then inside while it's in the data stream, you're manipulating it uh, before it outputs again. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll have to put that out. I mean, like, that's what I'm seeing in my head, but that's just the one thing that confused me about this is I just know, I have no idea what that's doing because well, in the examples of the, in the book, it's like event reactive is just waiting for like, it's waiting for an action to happen in that first like argument of it. But that doesn't look like an, an action that looks like, well, it's, it is an action, but it's not like the action in, in the sense that I'm thinking. Would it be, could you add an observer inside that, that call then and maybe get some debugging output to see exactly what the, what the stream is doing? You might. And that's where I got kind of stuck with some of the exercises was figuring out how to create right. and observe uh, an observe, observe event to actually see what that output is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I sidetracked us there, but no, that's, that's my fine. question that I have. Maybe we can, that might be something that we can explore when we start next week is we can try to, you know, deconstruct this and add in the observers that, that everybody's talking about. Um, in any case, um, I'll, this was, this was the end of the, of the instruction there. So um, you get to pick what, what uh, what what product you like, and you can click on you know read me a story, tell me a story. And you can see oh this is, looks troubling. Ten month old male crawling on carpet knocked over a cup of liquid nitrogen. It's spilled on part of the leg. That's it might be the only time that children and liquid nitrogen work together. Trip on bathroom rug. Yeah. Uh, again, some, some of these are, are pretty tragic, uh, and, and my heart goes out to those people. Um, others are a little funnier. Um, our time is up here, so let me, maybe we can fix, we can pick this up when we start next week. Uh, we'll talk about this thing, this, this section here that, that we uh, were talking about, and then there's one last I guess, exercise that I thought I would advance, which was <clears throat> to be able to add in a, a different uh, drop down so that you can see the product and the body part at the same time. You can select by product and you can select by body part. Um, and then you can explore uh, however, however you want to see the different narratives from there. So um, anyway, we can do that. So. Uh, we need to figure out who's going to cover chapter five because I probably only need maybe five or 10 minutes left on this one. So we've got chapter five next week. Yeah, I had, um, I, I had like project review on it, but I, I'm starting to rethink the format of this a little bit. And so I think we probably should just move on into chapter five and give us some more time to kind of think about it. So if anybody wants to take on chapter five, you know, let us know. If not, it will default to me, which I'm, I'm more than happy to do. Okay. Maybe let's put it in the Slack and see if there's any takers. And then other than that, um, it'll just be, we'll let Colin handle it depending, depending on the results. Sound okay? I do have a question. I mean, I don't want, I don't want to waste too much time. I don't want to waste anybody's time. So, I mean, if people have to jump off the call, please go ahead. But has anybody solved the last problem, the last exercise? Like, I have no idea how to address that. Like, zero idea. Like, the last, the last exercise in the book, it's like, and again, if anybody has to jump off, like, you know, please do. Don't, don't think you have to stay for my entertainment or anything, but I, I just, I can't figure it out. Like, I, like I, I sat there for a couple hours, like, the other day, and I was like, I can't figure this out. It's I like... 
Yep. It's like, it's like providing an action button to go forward and backwards within the narrative. But then, um, yeah, I don't know how to do that. The farthest I've got on it was understanding that the action button iterates by one every time you click it. So I was thinking that you could do something like create that input for, you know, the back and forth, but, and then use that, like that number that gets outputted based on that action to do some like subsetting of that list of narratives based on what was selected. But like I've, after that, I could not figure that out. Like I had well, no idea. It's incrementing and decrementing, right? So it's, it's advancing by one, re retarding by one, correct? That's what I was thinking. But then I was sitting there thinking about like, what does the reactive graph look like in that case? Because my question was, I was looking at, cause I was, I was like, okay, well, let's just map out the reactive graph. And what kept tripping me up was, do I have to create two reactive expressions to do this? Or like, can I use one and take two inputs to that reactive expression? Cause it's gonna be an event reactive, right? Because you're waiting right. for the user to hit the next or back button. So I guess I understood the input, the output. It's the reactive expression part that I didn't understand because part of me thought it was use one reactive expression but then I was like, well, maybe it's two reactive expressions. And then I was like, well, maybe it's three reactive expressions. So I, I, got, I, got, I got lost in this one because this one was really, really tough. And I didn't even want to take on the advanced one because that one I was like, I have no, I don't even know how to even increment it. But I think it has to do with subsetting, right? Like that's what I think, right? You have to input that selected list and then you increment using you know you increment using the buttons forward and backward but and maybe maybe i'm th overthinking it but i was wondering if anybody had any i didn't get a chance to get all the way to that exercise so i can't say exactly on that although i know there's some online solution manuals which might have some input in there yeah i'll have to look that up i mean i just this one was really really challenging for me it's something really simple, but then you're like sitting to think about it. You're like, it's kind of challenging to figure out. Anyways, maybe I'll post it on the Slack, see if anybody can figure it out, or maybe I'll poke around and see if I can find something. But if anybody has a solution and wants to tell me how to do it, please let me know. We can cover it at the beginning of next week as well, too. So. Yeah.